Should we plan on meeting at the uh, front around what time? 3.30, okay? 3.30? Okay. okay. So the I, thing have, that ends? I have a three, so I I'm guessing it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, say 3.34, I'll yeah. text you or. Sorry, I'll be cardless with okay. uh, okay. the. Um, I that sounds good. Valley. Okay. We've uh, gone off the, uh, so the card. Uh, the, uh, Should be okay. Hopefully so we'll three hours. miss rush hour coming out. Uh, are you basically trying to? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have another car that's going to take us midway to the city. Okay. San Francisco. And she would do the uh, wrap around. Got it. So. Okay. <laughs> All set logistics. <laughs> <man. laughs> All set logistics. It's okay. an interesting uh, <laughs> low. So, we'll uh, you, so you guys aren't driving. We're yeah, we're you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, no, there's a car. Oh, okay. The van. Oh, okay. Plenty of space. No, I thought you were literally behind the wheel driving. What's, what's no. the heel <laughs> <You're laughs> <gonna say. laughs> from the inside we could, side of the country no, yeah, I'm worried it. about? <laughs> do you ever drive when you're in China? I do. In Shanghai. In Shanghai is a little better. Yeah. yeah. It's I, just uh, like driving to work. I, vi I visited Shanghai yeah. last year for the first time. Um, there's a great Vietnamese restaurant in the French Quarter. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you ever tried it, but they, um, they fly in fresh fish yeah. every day. Uh, I forget I the name of it. There aren't that many Vietnamese only, restaurants. There's only one in yeah. that, what's in that is, quarter. Is it, is, it, is it one of the fancy ones? It's a fancy one. That's kind of a. It's got a little you know, patio courtyard area, and it's um, it, it's fairly it's fairly authentic Vietnamese yeah. cuisine. I'm trying to remember if there were some fusion dishes. Yeah. But uh, there's only one in that area there. Hmm. It's good. You should well, try it. Uh, if you remember the name. Uh, yeah. I'll, yeah. Yeah. I don't Check know. Do out. you make it down in that area, or is it well, so touristy close. that you just try no, to stay away? It's very, um, it's a very residential area. There's a bunch okay. of uh, nice restaurants in the area. What do you yeah. think about the my parents live near the internal group? Oh, okay. Of so you're over there a lot. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a it's a fairly uh, that, I think that's, big area. That's not controversial. Yeah. It's all in downtown. How much slower okay. and uh, how long before? Yeah. Uh, so there, you know, yeah. It's, there's some sort of My office is right on the east side of the French concession area. Okay. Yeah. Machine Hand Theater. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. always new restaurants. I'm always interested. Yeah. Um, well, um, every time I go, I make it a point to yeah. have the soup dumplings. It sounds like it's been there for, you know, because 20% of restaurants go away after. Oh, is that right? Oh, I hope that one. I hope that well, one it didn't. Sounds like you know, authentic. You know, it was just last year, and you know, they, she's and the uh, the restaurant owner, this this woman <laughs> is just a sweetheart. I mean, she's yeah. out there. You know, talking well, to the patrons. Yeah, when I think I gave that. I mean, just as good a time as all the tourists are. One day, yeah. I mean, Interesting. Yeah. 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 Passion is half, half yeah. the game, right? Yes. We, we, we had a discussion about the the, the, the risk of the Chinese economy. I, I, sorry, I can't remember. Yeah. What's, what's your take on Chinese economy right now? I've been advocating about they, they should give up this target or this tournament mentality. It's just a hangover, really, from yeah. the old Soviet system yeah. where the emperor dictates what's yeah. happening. And it's getting perverse now. It is the press, uh, it's the premier who used to say we shouldn't have this hard way. Now it's the premier himself who is now very stick to it. Which speaks to this now the existence. Exactly, exactly. You have to hold it. Exactly. Yeah, once you're sitting in that post, then you're thinking from that post perspective, not what is right for the country. Yeah, exactly. Or trying to massage so that. Yes. I love that. I will send you an email and we can set up. Uh, I will be out of the country for three weeks, but I'll be back in early October. Yeah. Okay. Look forward to it.
Hi, Rebecca. I'm Jim. Hi. Hi. Ron. Nice to meet you. Hello, hi, I'm Ming Ju. Nice to meet you. Okay, thanks. Good day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Blumenstein. I'm the deputy editor in chief of the Wall Street Journal. And I first of all want to apologize for being late. I don't know if any of you been, have been caught in uh, Tianjin traffic, but uh, 
Uh, I had an appointment outside the center, and uh, my apologies. Thanks very much for being here. We have uh, a great panel here, and um, one thing we really want to do, uh, according to the, the title of this panel, is to debate whether or not we're in a dot-com bubble. And I'm going to start out by taking a survey of all of you before I introduce our panelists and see what you think. And what I'd like to do is also take a survey at the end and see if any of the um, opinions here have changed your mind. So um, can I get a show of hands? How many of you do think, walking into this panel, that we're in the middle of a bubble? Could I just see a show of hands? OK, a few hands. So how many don't think we're in the middle of a bubble? OK, so I'd say that that, that carries the room at this point. Um, well, with that, let me introduce our panelists. Um, to my left is Ron Cao, who's founder and managing director of Lightspeed China and um, has been investing in companies across the tech sector in China for some time. Uh, Ju Ning is deputy director of finance um, at the Shanghai Advanced Institute for Finance. And as we get started here, Ju, um, I'd love you to uh, get us going with a definition of what a bubble actually is, since you're the sitting economist in the room. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Max Levchin here. He's the co-founder of PayPal and Yelp, two rather small internet successes, um, and is now um, working in San Francisco-based uh, innovation um, lab HVP, and um, in the belly of the beast, I'd say. So I'm very interested in getting your view of... Uh, of uh, what's happening. And finally, Jim Yagen, who's co-founder and executive um, of True Car USA, um, which had an IPO just in May, uh, raised $70 million. And um, even on the day of your IPO, had some interesting comments about whether or not we're in a bubble. So, um, Ju, I'd love you to get us started. What is a bubble? And, and what are we talking about here in terms of tech? So I, I was sharing with my panelists before coming in that I'm going to give a very honest but not very useful comment about bubbles. That is, only after the bubble burst will we, we, we'll be able to know whether we were in the bubble or not. So I've been working with uh, Professor Bob Schiller, who was the Nobel laureate last year at Yale on bubble-related research. And it's just amazing to see how people's disbelief in their living in a bubble can make the bubble become even bigger. I'll give you one example. 400 years ago, back in the Netherlands, one tip of tulip bulb can buy you 20 townhouses in the center of Amsterdam. So that is how crazy the bubble could have gone. And now I want to come back to this particular uh, time period. Well, I think going, by going through the uh, 1998 to 2000 internet bubble, I think the investors, the companies, and the, the, the regulators have all learned quite a bit about but what is a bubble back then? So I think those knowledge has been really helpful in preventing or at least uh, uh, attenuating the extent of having another bubble. And I want to just put two things into perspective. Uh, one is from a valuation perspective. Yes, we are looking at some richer valuations than historical average, but it's not as far as to two standard deviation, which is a little bit too egghead, but it's not too far away from the historical average. So I think we are looking at richer valuations than average, but not that bad. And another perspective is, if you look at the, the, the motivation behind this higher valuation, I think that's closely related to the reflow of capital from emerging markets back in, into the US, and in this bigger context, and in the context of a very low interest rate in the US right now, there's really not any better investment vehicles in the US. So in some way, I want to draw the analogy between the internet sector in the US and the real estate sector in China. The difference is, I think, for one, for the internet bubble or the internet valuation, it is higher, but it's not too far away from the average, whereas the, the Chinese real estate sector is probably beyond what most people could imagine. So I will, I will probably stop here. So in coming days, we're going to see the IPO of Alibaba, which may uh, be one of the biggest or the biggest IPO ever in the world. Uh, so far this year, I believe in the U.S., uh, we've, uh, there's been a $47 billion raised in IPOs. Um, and uh, we're getting back to 2,000 in, uh, in terms of this level of, of activity. Uh, Ron, do you, from your perch, are you getting worried about what's happening in China, particularly with the Alibaba frenzy? Um, well, sure, answer, sure answer is no. Uh, I mean, the, um, 
you know, uh, I was studying this topic and I actually saw the chart right before you showed up there. It showed the uh, number of IPOs uh, from uh, 1997 to 2011. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, 2000, 99, it was a long time ago. And I think we forgot how big of a party that was, how great of a party that was. You know, there were, there were 300 IPOs in 99, 2000. Uh, and uh, uh, I think last year we had, I think less than 100, uh, I think it's about 80 or so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 30 or so, I saw this data, 30 or so venture-backed tech IPOs. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a one-tenth of the number. Uh, and we, we also looked at numbers uh, internally uh, from um, just, you know, looking at uh, valuation numbers. The, um, you know, the number of uh, IPOs that, uh, in addition to the number of IPOs, the number of IPOs that had doubling the first day of trading in 99 was about like 100, one third of the IPOs doubled the first day of trading. And, you know, those phenomena is not, is not you're not seeing that today. Uh, certainly, there are exceptions. Alibaba, I think, you know, it's a company that's been around for so long. It's a great IPO. It's going to be uh, greatly valued. But uh, uh, on, on, you know, on par, I would say we're, we're, we're still, you know, we're, we're going to perhaps a bubble situation, but I think we're, right now we're fairly rational uh, in general. Max, from your perch, what's your opinion of the debate? So I think it's, uh, it's just way too easy to oversimplify the whole thing, and I'm I'm opposed to oversimplification on the uh, principal basis. So I think there's a bunch of things going on. One, it's important to remember that the stock market is just a proxy for value. It's not actually a true representation of value being created by entrepreneurs. Alibaba is one of the greatest companies ever established, controls 80% of e-commerce in China, has, after it seems like a forever existence, something like 46% growth year and year in the last quarter alone. It's you know, whatever price it fetches, that's what the market thinks, how valuable it is, but it is uniquely valuable. So a whole bunch of companies like Alibaba, public and private in the US and worldwide today, and the world has flattened in a sense that there's plenty of these companies outside of the US, but the typical recipient of barbs on the valuation side of things is, is Uber. And if you think about Uber rationally, it's very easy to see that given their success today and the lock in the network effects, the fact that they have a global and local network effect, all of it together combines into essentially a potential market cap. There I go using market analogies, of course. Uh, it's rough, a total addressable market that's roughly Hertz times FedEx. So this could be an enormous, enormous success, much in the vein of Alibaba. So those companies deserve the rich valuations, and calling them a bubble is insulting to them and to the people that built them. Having said that, there's a ton of little companies still working on things that are entirely pedestrian and worthless and will die. And if anything, compared to 2000, it's much better because they will never go public. There's plenty of good ones to take public, so the little ones, they'll get acquired, and there's no better place to put an entrepreneur these days than into a director role in one of these companies that's a rocket ship. So as far as I'm concerned, things are generally pretty rational. Jim, you've actually uh, lived through an IPO. What's your sense of the bubble? Well, it's interesting just Four months ago, next week would be our four-month anniversary of being a public company, and uh, the public markets were extremely choppy. And, and I remember reading um, headlines on whether True Cars IPO would be a bellwether for whether we were in a bull or a bear market, and uh, we priced under guidance, and we, we came out with a market cap of just over 700 million, and today we're 1.6 billion, so we've done extremely well. In, in the four months, but to Max's point, I don't know that it's an indicator of the value sorry, I, that we've created. What's your true value? Right. G given right. your name, you, know, you, you should be pricing yourself to what you're That's worth. right. And so, you know, where we think our value is how we address the market that we're addressing and the value that we deliver. We've saved consumers over $3.5 billion off the uh, sticker price of a car. That's a million and a half consumers. And on the other end, we've saved automotive retailers over $350 million and have created market efficiency in their marketing spend and customer acquisition costs. And I think over time, uh, and, and that's with just over 1% market share. So we have a long ways to go. And over time, if we can continue delivering that kind of value, then hopefully the market will continue to, to see, um, and it'll translate into our stock price. There's certainly a role of big companies in all this. I know that earlier this year, Facebook and the WhatsApp uh, uh, purchase, I think, is something that set this uh, debate off into an entirely new level. Um, 
uh, it was valued at $19 billion. And we continue to see, as Max, you just said, the, 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 the dynamic of big companies uh, swallowing up uh, smaller companies. Are you seeing this in, in China as well with Alibaba and Tencent, this, this phenomena? And, and do you worry about that, the big companies kind of bulking up as quickly as they can to fend off each other? Well, as, as an early stage investor, we, we, we actually like that. Well, we like that. So, so um, uh, like Max says, that not everybody's going to go public. Uh, not, com not every company is going to become great, but they have a certain value at a certain period of time. Uh, the fact that the, uh, the giants in China are very competitive right now, uh, you know, fighting over turf of commerce and social and, and eyeballs and traffic, you know, it creates a lot of opportunities for startups. I think this is, you know, in terms of venture in China, I've been doing this for about 10 years. This is probably the best time in terms of creating new, uh, new ideas. Uh, not just, you know, one is because the exit market is more, more healthy. Uh, you, you don't need to just go public or that's not the only route. There's other routes to, to create exits for uh, companies, but also, uh, you know, we'll probably go into a little bit more at this panel, hopefully, you know, things like mobile, things like peer-to-peer, -peer sharing economy, uh, you know, uh, some of the enterprise technologies are, are, these are areas that are quite exciting right now. Juning or Max, do you have any sense? Are the big companies uh, threatening to, to really ruin this for everybody else with such high valuations? I don't think so. I think the um, it's not as though on any given day there are billions and billions of dollars being spent on these acquisitions. Every time something like this happens, it's typically a reporting worthy event. The WhatsApp deal was heavily debated and it's still heavily debated and I don't think Facebook has another five of those tucked away ready to happen. Um, the Probably the biggest danger of these incredible valuations we see in the public markets is the currency they wind up having, not so much in the acquisition scenario, but in the scenario of uh, compensating workers. So startups are, in Silicon Valley, which is why China has such an enormous advantage just being larger, have a terrible time hiring, in part because every 21-year-old college graduate says, well, I have a $2 million effective currency offer from Google and $95,000 plus 3% of a company that probably will get acquired by Google anyway. <laughs> this one seems faster. I just want to make one quick comment. I think for large companies such as Yahoo, such as uh, Time Warner, such as AT&T and Microsoft, if we were in the bubble, they're making just as dumb decisions as anybody else is. So, I mean, they have made really crazy acquisitions during the peak of the last internet bubble. So there's really no, not too much uh, peace of mind to have if it is an offer from a, a large company. I think they sometimes are actually sprawling the party because they're driving, like Max said, they're driving the, the competition even higher for the valuation and for the compensation to the key employees. I think this is true so long as you mean in terms of the high upper, upper echelons of the acquisitions. At the small scale, the half a million dollar, million dollar aqua hire type acquisitions are actually seem to work pretty well. The, there's no pretense about what's going on. Just getting engineers paying $100,000, $200,000 signing bonus to their investors, which is a strange dynamic, but uh, you appreciate it. Um, the thing that I completely agree with is every time you look at the fill in the blank, Microsoft buying, okay, whatever, whatever it is, the most recent ridiculous one, like, you know it will not work out. You know they cannot absorb the company because the desire is to take over the synergies, to really capitalize on that. And the only kind of thing that works is you buy and you let it be, sort of Google YouTube being the classic uh, success story. So, um, yeah. Jim, have you thought of, um, you've obviously opted to go alone and that's your, that's your strategy, but uh, you know, Ford comes along or GM? Uh, has that been something as, as you look at uh, possibilities they, here? They would be very unlikely suitors, but we certainly had the big companies come knocking uh, pre-IPO. Um, it was quite a frenzy. Um, but it, it, uh, I think as one of the co-founders and as an entrepreneur, um, it forced us to really um, sort of go through a self-examination process about what we're trying to do and why we started the business in the first place and how that would change 
if we didn't go it alone and stay the course, right? And, and there's certainly, when you're a public company, there's always the pressure of the public markets. And are you able to withstand that pressure? Are you able to ignore the volatility in the stock price? We never looked at the stock price when we were a private company, and we never base our decision on the day-to-day -day fluctuation in the stock price. Our stock price has grown nearly 136% in four months, but it, it wasn't a linear uh, trajectory. I mean, just this week we had 15% volatility in the stock price, and, and making short-term decisions um, that compromises the long-term sustainable value in the business and why we started this business is a challenging thing uh, and a trade-off, certainly as a public company. So I'll share one more thing. I think uh, relative to China, I think uh, in, in sort of a follow-up here, uh, you're seeing more of these deals being structured in China where the, uh, the giants are uh, taking a significant piece of ownership. Uh, they won't buy 100%, they buy 50%, 51%, 60% in some cases. Trinar is a perfect example of Baidu bought uh, controlling interest, but let the management run with it, you know, make decisions, retain their talent, and go for the eventual IPO and still be somewhat independent. Uh, we just sold a company to Chihu in the same, similar structure. Uh, over you know, multi-hundred million dollar acquisition, controlling interest, management team still has some cash out, but hey, there's still more to do. So I think that we haven't seen as many of those deals in the U.S. Maybe that's a, you know, a, a China phenomenon because talent is even harder, I think even harder to hire in China or retain for that matter. So uh, that's something that's worked out pretty well. <clears throat> I want to talk for a moment about value creation, and Max, to your point earlier, setting aside the stock market, what are you looking at in terms of value creation? Are we talking about jobs? Um, could we be simply looking at uh, uh, a significant shift that technology is playing around the world um, across industries, across the way people live? Um, uh, could, could we be in, in many respects seeing the promise finally of what was talked about in the dot-com era? How do, you, how do you think about value beyond the short term? you know, Wall Street outlook. Right, so in that sense, I think, if you define bubble, not economically, but sort of humanely as in, is there really a proportionate level of elevation from poverty, improvement of human condition, et cetera, compared to the nominal growth as exhibited by the stock market, no matter what you think of the valuation and a dollar exchange ratio, we are certainly solving harder, more important problems today than we did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the internet was all about, not all about, but half of it was about something that remained and the other half fizzled. Today, a number of companies that I look at that are curing cancers and figuring out how to mine planets for precious metals is way more. It is, it, those are not outliers. Those are kind of the sort of things that I like to look at and invest in and, and help create. So to me, the assessment of how we're doing as, as an industry is first and foremost around number of human lives that are being changed for the better worldwide because of the developing economies participating so much more aggressively, it's actually easier. You know, there's this internal notion of elevating 10 million people out of poverty in China every year, things like that. It's easier to do today, frankly, because technology is reaching us. And 10 years ago, starting a farming technology startup in the US was a joke. Starting a farming technology startup in China, which just wasn't talked about. Today, we're looking at a half dozen farming agriculture technology startups in the US, and it's gonna be 10 times more important in China, where urbanization is a huge problem, and the food supply, food safety is just continuously a strain. So in that sense, couldn't be more excited about where we are. I mean, value's being created very, very rapidly. I wish there was more investment in, in those categories, independent of what you think of the availability of the investment dollars. And you see investment dollars going into more of those social good companies beyond um, the traditional tech ones. I, I do. I, it is dangerous to classify them as social good because that almost puts them into this bucket of like, well, those things that aren't really gonna make money, but they're important anyway. Like, I disagree. I think those are fundamentally gonna make a ton of money and they are touching things that are traditionally thought of low margin industries, but you know, a very, very small fraction of a penny in something that's a couple of trillion dollars, such as energy, is a pretty good amount of potential uh, impactful revenue. So it does appear to be that most venture capitalists are starting to think beyond the standard four-year cycle, which is where a lot of this actually came from in Silicon Valley, certainly. One nice side benefit to it is that 
Most bubbles, the ebb and flow goes through it at most a decade, typically four to five years, at least in my sort of internet memory. If you invest in something that's supposed to live for 100 years or at least 20 years, you're going to live through a couple of bubbles, and you're just going to condition yourself to not care what your stock is doing. If you're going 15% week on week, whatever, you have another couple of million weeks to think about as a lifespan of your company. That's not an important event. Juning, should we be looking at value differently than a just numbers? Uh, absolutely. I think, I mean, uh, well, I think Warren Buffett has said something during the last uh, Internet Bubble. He's saying, well, I'm not going to buy anything I can now understand from an evaluation perspective. So I think valuation is really important because valuation reflects the balance between risk and returns when it comes down to investments. Uh, but I, I want to first add up to uh, Max's comments. I think I was in a, a, a university leaders forum yesterday, and we were talking about how technology has transformed from the uh, technology, uh, education's impact in health, wealth, impact, and knowledge. It's, there's so much that has going on due to the contribution of technology innovation. So that's really changing how people live their lives and how we communicate and how we are educated. So I think it's really being underappreciated just, just from a pure dollar or from a, a stock price perspective. And related to that, I think, uh, what, what's wrong with a bubble? I think if it's simply a rise and a decrease in the share prices, then it's really not a big deal. I think the really uh, true implication or the consequence of a bubble is the misallocation or the prolonged misallocation of resources and risks in this society. I think I mean, as long as that is not happening, that people with very good training in other fields are giving up their day jobs and then just trying to do, become day traders of internet stocks, I think as long as that is not happening, I think that is still within the reasonable range. But if everyone, as it is the case in, in China right now, everyone is trying to build their biggest chunk of wealth through real estate investment, then that's probably having a worse consequence on the entire society than the internet bubble. Ron, valuation in China. Um, obviously, there are a lot of issues here, as, uh, as Max was saying, that technology can help address and is addressing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we focus on early stage. Uh, you know, the valuation fluctuation there is, is typically not that large over years. You know, we, I think, you know, maybe 2000, Nine was you know five six million pre now it's maybe ten million pre uh, so uh, but you know at um, you know the series C and D level I think that's where you can see there's a huge valuation increase I think we're I don't have the numbers but I, I suspect a series C or D are averaging in the you know hundred to three hundred million range you know uh, then then you're if you're investing that round then you're saying you know this is going to be a two billion dollar company right and. <laughs> And we know that that's not going to happen for, for a lot of those companies. Uh, so, uh, and there there are fairly aggressive investors that are doing you know convertible debt. I don't want you know I don't want to set a valuation. I don't know if it's two hundred or three hundred, but I'll give you money. I'll convert later. Uh, and, you know, uh, in some ways you're protecting principal, but in some ways that's a sign of uh, you know aggressive pricing uh, to get into the deal. Uh, but I think I think I do echo sort of the things that are being funded are fun fundamentally different in China. Uh, we're, we're, we're focused more on consumer economy investments. Uh, so, you know, my, uh, our, our nanny uh, just got an iPhone. I mean, that's one month of salary. You know, she, she's on Wei Xin. She's uh, buying things, I'm sure. You know, so we, you know, uh, and, and that, that's, that's very interesting. You know, we, we, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're investments in, you know, investments in, for example, we, we did an investment in a company that does, uh, uh, it's a mobile platform to allow um, uh, you to find a temporary driver. It's called Idai Jia. Uh, so if you, if you had a couple of drinks and you go out and uh, you can't drive home, and, and drinking driver laws are very strict in China, uh, you open this app and you can find 20 drivers nearby that's willing to work. And, and what's happening is that these drivers, uh, before this app, they would, you know, they're, they're, they're probably a taxi driver uh, or they're just a factory worker. They're not making a lot of money. And, and we interview a lot of these drivers. They're increasing their salary by twice the amount by working extra, you know, 10 hours a week. At nighttime, so so this is an example of how how you know technology is, is helping lives in, in, you know in a, in a direct sense. I just want to add very quickly to uh, 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 Ron's comments, but there there is I think there's a great deal of investment opportunities then, uh, in that area, but then there's also a, an additional layer of risk, which is the regulation. Absolutely, and and for that reason I didn't talk about Uber because that's that's more sensitive, and here is more uh, uh, more about labor and, and you know directly applying that. But 
Jim, you have a very different landscape in the U.S., a, a, a crowded one, perhaps. Uh, uh, how do you look at value and uh, what your company and other tech companies can bring? Well, a lot of what we do is addressing uh, a lot of inefficiencies in the automotive retail process. I mean, an interesting stat, uh, when you look at the number of new car franchises in the U.S., it outnumbers the number of Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, and coffee bean combined. Right? Uh, it outnumbers the number of McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's restaurants combined. It's just a staggering number of dealerships um, for a purchase that happens once every four or five years. And, and the process that consumers go through and the investments that uh, dealers and manufacturers make, um, there's so much inefficiency. And so you know, what we do in terms of the value creation is saving time and money. You know, and time is money. And so there's, when, 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 can, when we can do those, those things, then hopefully the reallocation of the time and the resource translates in, into value somewhere else. You mentioned uh, the R word, regulation. Um, at, we're seeing the Facebook uh, acquisition being reviewed in Europe. Um, obviously, there's different uh, countries with different laws where Uber may not be um, as successful in, in some places, though I might add, I believe the company is facing some of its biggest challenges in Miami. Um, is, is, is regulation something that it, uh, investors are perhaps underestimating when, um, when they bid up these shares and, and have as much confidence than they do in, in tech? Well, it's, a, it's a tough question because it's, it's China, it's uh, uh, a lot of things are moving in progress. Uh, you know, the, uh, even in, in, in the Western world, you know, the technology oftentimes are ahead of uh, regulation. So, you know, for example, the, uh, the whole digital asset class, that, that is something that, that's got regulators, you know, trying to figure out how, how to deal with that. Uh, certainly the sharing economy where, where we made a lot of bets was, the, you know, sort of the Airbnb model. I talked about Edai Job model. We, we, uh, we also invested in a uh, PDP car rental company, right? If you can rent your house out to someone else, can't you rent your car out to someone else? Um, you know, it, it seems like it could work. So we're experimenting with that. Certainly all those things are touching on regulation. It's unprecedented, you know, uh, what happens, something happens. <laughs> you know, who's responsible for, and uh, is it the platform, is it the other person, or, you know. Uh, so these are, I think these are things that need to be uh, worked through. In general, we make an assessment on that risk uh, and uh, there are certain areas you don't want to be touching. I think you know if it's sort of um, areas where it's just not clear and we want to work it through, we're willing to take that risk in, 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 in many, many ways. Juning, are, are you uh, uh, seeing regulation keeping up here in, in China and elsewhere, or is this going to continue to be an issue? Well, I, I personally do not think that is such a huge issue for entrepreneurs. I and mean, I think, uh, going back to Max's comments, if you're really keen with one key technology or one business model, then it's just a matter of whether you're willing to live long enough to uh, see the, the, the eventual success. But I think it is a bigger issue to investors like uh, uh, Ron or... Uh, I think if you're looking at there, there's a timeline for your exit, then there's really considerable amount of risk you have to evaluate. Uh, especially, I think, in emerging markets, including China, because, well, the, uh, the, the environment is so dynamic and there are so many other factors that could marginally touch upon your uh, particular investment. So I think it is definitely far more uh, important a factor to consider than it is in the U.S. or in Europe. I want to open it up for questions in just one moment. But, um, but Jim, uh, on the topic of regulation, part of the intrinsic nature of what you're doing is butting against franchise laws and and some decades old regulations in the US and did you talk about that? Sure, I mean it, it's remarkable how regulated uh, automotive retail is in, in the US. Um, the concept of auto e-commerce in the US probably won't happen in our lifetime uh, just because uh, of the franchise laws. Um, one of our investors, Elon Musk, has his own challenges trying to um, retail Tesla. And in the state of Texas alone, he can't sell a Tesla. It's a, it's a remarkable challenge. And we, as a company, had a near-death experience in 2012, um, purely because of the regulatory environment and whether we were violating advertising laws and our websites and <clears throat> our mobile complied with font size laws. Right, and that were there for the, to protect the auto industry 
and consumers around the print in a classified ad. Um, there's regulatory um, protections for the franchise system that you mentioned that outlaws brokering in some states. And if you get paid in the connection with the sale of a car, which we do, you might be viewed as a broker. But how someone pays um, for a service being rendered doesn't necessarily mean they're a broker. We don't set the price of the vehicle. We don't take possession of the vehicle. We don't take possession of the consumer's money. But the laws are written so broadly, it can be defined however the incumbent system wants to define it, right? And so we, we had some real challenges. And Max, uh, before we open it up, I mean, PayPal, you must have been thinking a lot about uh, banking and the way we finance and running intrinsically into, into a lot of laws and regulations. How, how, do you, how do you frame that in your mind? So I actually view regulation as a competitive advantage. So I think one of the things you learn as an entrepreneur, having gone and succeeded in a heavily regulated market, you realize that it's a tax you pay and it's a little bit of a seemingly insurmountable amount from the outside looking in. But once you've been there, you realize it's not it's irrational, but it's not insane. There's a lot of regulatory pieces that just really don't make sense, but they were there 100 years ago, and they're still kind of there waiting for their time in a spotlight in the Senate in the US and the equivalent bodies worldwide. As an entrepreneur, if you choose to go into that industry, it's almost by definition huge and very hard to disrupt and has enormous amount of inefficiency. So if you really want a big opportunity and a big challenge, pick it at a regulated market. So, you know, to healthcare, energy, um, education, finance, insurance, any one of those markets are the last laggards in the world of really being reinvented using software. Every one of those things is a trillion dollar opportunity worldwide. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, grow a, grow a spine and, and then go for it. I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I don't know if Thad is in the house. Um, Thad, what are your thoughts about uh, the bubble and have any of the opinions up here changed your mind? Well, I, I have a question uh, for these folks because, um, you know, one of the things that really stick in my mind is what are the hidden dangers for a company to go public during times of high valuation? So I think he's the best qualified person to answer that. At a time, well, I, I would say that we were probably undervalued when we weren't out, and so I, I don't know that uh, that was an issue for us being overvalued. Um, but <clears throat> um, from an employee standpoint that Max brought up, when you're overvalued as a, as a company, if, if the market, uh, say if there's a bubble, it corrects itself, then, then you have some real employee morale issues, right? That's just a simple fact of recruiting, retaining, and trying to build uh, an environment where employees, you're, you're trying to build a culture uh, around passion of, of solving a problem, but at the same time, they want to see the rewards, and when they see that evaporate because of the bubble, then it becomes incredibly um, challenging for you to manage the business. I think in the times of being public, independent of what the market is like, the employee productivity drops good 15 to 20% of time simply yeah. wasted reloading the page on <laughs> NASDAQ or NYSE. <laughs> I think the, yeah. at PayPal when we went public, I, one of my jobs was running security for the company, just their local security, and one interesting thing that occurred is we saw an entirely new traffic pattern emerge when every one of our employees downloaded the Java applet that would connect to level two quotes on NASDAQ and look at the <laughs> trades, not at the price, but at what contracts were, were being traded for our yeah. stock. All of this happened within 24 hours of going public, even though every single person was locked up for six months. Yeah. So yeah. none of these people traded. They were all just looking. So productivity goes quite down. And I just want to add it briefly. I, I think it also get, gives both the management and the uh, 
uh, ordinary folks this sense of complacency. I mean, we're reaching this milestone, and then we can finally take a breather and relax for at least some time. But then if you're going on the wrong track because you are so well-funded, then you might be just taking a slack and going on to the wrong track. So that combination cannot really be very good to the company. Ron, what have you seen here in China? Well, I mean, certainly, um, you know, if you have options in terms of when you go public, that's a, that's a luxury, right? You can, you can uh, but, but certainly a market when it's good, it's, it's a, you know, you have more flexibility in going, going public then. Um, but, um, you know, but I think, I think if you look at companies that have been around for a while, it didn't really matter when they put one public. It didn't really matter, right? It's, it's sort of uh, uh, Alibaba took many years to go public. They could have gone many times uh, earlier, so... Uh, so it's really it's really it's 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 a complex question, uh, but market conditions probably just one of a few factors. Are there any other questions? Yes. Hi. Just a, a thought in terms of the question you asked about: Is there a difference between uh, 2000 and what you're seeing now? I think there's a huge difference. I mean, just my perception: 2000 was a lot about novelty and not really showing how you could actually create value. It was just more about can you throw cool stuff up on a screen and have lots and lots of folks look at it. Whereas if you look at the companies we're talking about now, they're fundamentally uh, creating value through process efficiency. I mean, the, the question of, of does technology create more jobs, I think, is a misguided question. If you got rid of all technology, we'd have 100% employment because we'd, we'd all be running around <laughs> gathering grass and killing rabbits for dinner. Um, you know, that's not the point. The, the point is that um, in, uh, for crew car, he's saving someone from having to go to seven or eight different dealers to find something that's a possible experience. In the case of Yelp, he's saving someone from having to call up five or six friends. Have you been there? What was the restaurant like? And so on and so on. What we choose to do with that extra time both societally and personally, is really what the issue is. I mean, it, the, the environment is going to continue to change, and there's a societal imperative to reinvest in our society, but there's also a personal imperative. You know, if you're the guy who's driving the, uh, who, who's the best buggy whip, whip driver in the world, and all of a sudden that job no longer exists, you have a responsibility to learn how to drive a car. And could you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Shane Pata, CEO of uh, Health Integrated. We're a uh, data-enabled healthcare services company in the U.S. Thanks for that. Anyone else? And if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, name is Eric Motero. I work for AMIA. We're a loyalty marketing company, a uh, Canadian or a global company. Uh, the question I have is how much of this bubble question really isn't about thinking about capitalism with a bit of an old frame of mind, right? I mean, it used to be that if you're an industrial company, you do one thing and do one thing really well. So if something is wrong or a question when your business model, that's it. But if you look at the new economy, I mean, I think some of the points you made, right? You're creating value in a very different way. You're not going to, you know, stop going to Facebook because they're making less money or more money. You're building a customer relationship and a franchise. And so how much of this is we just need to think about valuations and value, frankly, from a capitalism point of view in a different way than we used to be? I don't spend a lot of time thinking about uh, reframing capitalism. I trust in its uh, free market uh, mechanics to, uh, to guide me. I'm not sure it's actually all that relevant to think about the markets in between the times you're fundraising as an entrepreneur, at which time it becomes an existential question. And as far as I'm concerned, about public markets, primarily in terms of how to put off the that moment in time when all of your employees start tracking level to quotes. So I'm, I'm, I'm relatively <laughs> bearish on participating in markets if I don't have to. How does this play out in China? It is interesting that Alibaba is listing in the US. Um, well, I think there are probably two layers uh, of explanation. One is why is Alibaba listed outside. The other is, I think, why is Alibaba becoming so big? I think uh, I mean, Chinese top three technology companies are uh, taking three spots off the top, top six largest IT companies in the entire world these days. And why is that? So I think the gentleman has a valid point in terms of, well, information technology has created a lot of value by serving the entire society. But at the same time, it is also changing the way how wealth is being actually, uh, allocated across the, 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 the society. So there's a 
definitely a, a stronger sense of winner takes all mentality that is part of the reason behind why I think those companies are able to create more values and having a higher chance of creating more bubbles because they have so much wealth they have to spend. So I think this is related to how, I don't think that is necessarily the entrepreneurs or the investors uh, uh, agenda, but I think it is how the government or the regulators would have to set a line between, well, if there is such a great deal of wealth being created, how can we have the value serve the, the greater good or the, the, the bigger part of the society? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, um, it, you know, it takes one data point to create a bubble. You know, it's sort of the crazy deal, and everybody feels everything's crazy. But the, um, you know, what, what, what I think what the, the greed factor in all this, right, is that a, a, a young kid with an idea, understand technology, can create a billion dollars for, for this company, right, uh, for his, his investors. So a few years ago, that, that wasn't apparent. Right now, it's apparent. So everybody say, well, if, even if I have a one out of 100 chance probability, I'll invest a million dollars. <laughs> You know, uh, angel investors become VCs, and, and you know, uh, PE guys, uh, hedge fund people become uh, PE guys, and, and, and all that, all that's creating this little bubblish feel. Uh, but I think you know, one thing about China, which, which is interesting, I think, is, is I mean, it's slightly a different topic, but but there's a lot of wealth being created too, and, and it's going to a few hands. Uh, so the whole in social enterprise, the, the whole you know, f f uh, the whole philanthropy movement is very clear to us on the front line. These are things that are, people are talking about uh, and people are doing. So hopefully those things translate to, to re really, uh, really meaningful social enterprises that, that can help to, to uh, uh, bring the level up for everybody. We have time for one more question. Uh, China Business News. Uh, thanks, you've talked about the Alibaba frenzy, and now its price has ranged from 60 to uh, 60, uh, 66 US dollars per share. So do you think it is kind of uh, um, overvalued? And given the overall regulation and the atmosphere in the United States, how do you think its prospect down the road? And any suggestions for its long-term sustainable development there? Does anyone want to take that? Advice for Alibaba. <laughs> whether you whether you think <laughs> whether you think um, Alibaba itself is overvalued with the with the estimates we're seeing. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, we focus on the Series A, so that's that's uh, that's a research topic for for the big banks. But but I think the you know what what's interesting is that uh, you know we we uh, we interview a lot of people from Alibaba. Uh, I think that's interesting. You know, they, they see the IPO coming and they're looking for other things. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, put the business model aside and all that. What, what is Alibaba, what, what's interesting to Alibaba is, is its corporate culture. It, it, that is, that's to me is very fascinating. Those interviews comes out, come across very uh, consistent. Uh, it's got a strong alignment of individual interests and also the company's interests where people can, you know, fight for the company. Uh, that, that's something that's, it's intangible, but I think that's going to drive the company to, for the heights. I, I found Jack Ma's letter to the shareholders fascinating around corporate governance, around the focus first towards the customer and the employees and the shareholders last. I think all the elements in the letter that he addressed to the shareholders, if you're going to invest in this company, expect these things. I think if you can hold true to that, um, I, I'd be an investor in the company. Before we uh, take our final vote that I uh, mentioned, I'd like to go around and um, see if you all have uh, uh, final thoughts um, that you'd like to share, a kind of a sound bite or, or what you predict is, uh, is, uh, is going to unfold as we, as we move on from here, especially in coming weeks with the Alibaba issue. Well, I think you know, China is not much different than the US. I would say the environment here is very entrepreneurial. Uh, I would say as an investor, this is probably, uh, you know, you can never say it's the best time because you never know, but it feels like there's a lot of things we can do that are, can be really meaningful outcomes. Uh, I do agree there, there, there are a lot of areas where it, uh, that's heavily regulated that's being disrupted by technology, and, and those are mega opportunities. So, um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're quite excited uh, about, uh, you know, at least uh, next few years, you can't really see too far away, but next few years, it'll be very interesting companies being built. Well, I, I think technology have created a lot of really great companies, company, created companies ever in human history, but I also want to caution from a pure academic research perspective. 
sometimes great companies can make terrible investments. I think uh, I'm very bullish on entrepreneurship. So I think so long as uh, the apparent nature of a kid with uh, technology knowledge and a billion dollar outcome is more transparent, more believable, people will try more things. And so long as the uh, market supports those initiatives, we're all going to be better off. And incidentally, just to echo your point, I think the, it's a topic for a different panel, but uh, we should never allow ourselves to slow down innovation simply out of fear that someone's going to have to finally give up that horse and buggy business that they treasured so successfully for 100 years. Uh, the, the thought of a bubble uh, doesn't give me any anxiety. Um, I like bubbles. I like bubble gum. I like uh, <laughs> bubbly water. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in L.A., and it's been 20 years since we've had an earthquake, and everybody knows it's coming, right? And you, you can build the right foundation and anticipate and survive the earthquake, or you can ignore it. Um, bubbles are bad if you're an investor and investing in the wrong company. If you're an entrepreneur and you're, you ignore it and you're not building a, a company with sustainable value, then, then the bubble will get you. I'll say to Okay, to close, um, how many of you in the audience feel that we are, are pro-bubble, that we're, that we're in a bubble? I think I see fewer hands. Okay, how many, how many um, put your hands up if you, if, uh, I think we have a relative consensus here of, of uh, convinced you that we are not in a bubble? Excellent. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank our panelists for a really fascinating discussion, and thanks to all of you. Thank you.